Welcome back. This is the second part of lecture 28, and uh, uh, I separated it because it's, uh, it's, it, it uh, focuses on a different type of system where we have a magnetic system, a spin system, and it, but it's a good example of phase transition. So in the previous lecture, we spent a lot of time on the liquid to gas and liquid to solid phase transitions. And this, this example here shows uh, another example with spins, but also uh, I'm going to introduce a computational method how to, to actually simulate those phase transitions um, in, in real systems. So the, 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 the Ising model is like this. We have a lattice of, let's say, atoms or sites, let's call them sites, which have a binary value on them. So very typically we use a binary value being the spin up or spin down. So there's a projection on the z-axis of the spin. So it's a spin one half system. And then we do, we, we, have a, we have a system like this and we are going to consider a number of things, a number of simplification to try to understand what's going on. So just uh, as we start this, this is a two dimensional example. And of course, uh, we can also look at that at one dimension and three dimension. So the Ising model um, works like this. Uh, we have a, certain, a set of atoms or, or sites arranged in a regular lattice. Uh, the state can be uh, either one or two, uh, uh, state one, state two can be up and down, zero and one, one minus one, typically one minus one. So we have these two possibilities, for example, up and down. And uh, now we decide, uh, at least if we have a paramagnetic ordering, and I'm going to mention that again in a second, we find that the energy is lowered when two neighboring sites have the same orientation. So this particular configuration here is more stable than this particular configuration here, at least in a ferromagnetic coupling. On top of that, we do not care what happens in the next nearest neighbor. We just want to look at the, the nearest uh, uh, neighbor. Okay, so in a, in a one dimensional chain, there will be two nearest neighbor. In a two dimensional chain, that is a square lattice, there will be four nearest neighbor and so on and so forth. So in this model, we only consider the nearest, near, nearest neighbors. Uh, in, the, in the previous uh, sections that we have discussed, where we've discussed phase transition, we were always minimizing the Gibbs function. The reason being that uh, we work at uh, constant, uh, constant uh, pressure and constant temperature. So the Gibbs function seems to be, uh, to be the, the right choice. However, here we are going to suppose the, the lattice is rigid. So in other words, we are working at constant volume. So in that case, if we work at constant volume and constant temperature, the, the right, uh, these are the natural variable for the, for the Helmholtz uh, function. So that's what we are going to use. So the Helmholtz function is U minus TS. Uh, and so uh, that means that uh, at low temperature, we expect um, that what matters would be U, which is the internal energy. And uh, at high temperature, we are going to have a term minus TS. So uh, high temperature means that uh, minus TS is going to start to dominate. And so we will see a clear effect of, uh, of the of entropic, uh, an entropic effect. So here are three examples of, of square lattices. Um, actually they are rectangular but they are, they are periodic and then we see that we have two uh, we have a degenerate uh, energy state for the ground state where all the spin are aligned either all up or all down the energy will be the same in both cases and this is the maximal the minimal energy that you can do so this is the optimal configuration and then on the at the bottom in the bottom we have a random energy state so as you, as you can tell from this particular example, which, is, which turns out to be simple, but we can learn a lot uh, from thermodynamics, we see that even though the first two systems have uh, um, high symmetry, I mean symmetry of, of a crystal uh, and low energy, they, they, is only, they are really only two microstates that correspond to that energy. Uh, in contrast, there are many, many more random uh, configuration that correspond to the random energy state. 
So that's definitely going to play a role as we consider the finite temperature effect. Remember, finite temperature effect is where the entropy start to play a role. So just to give you a bit more idea of what the icing model is, so we're going to introduce the Hamiltonian. So uh, it can be a, here; it's written in a in a quantum fashion, but it could be anything. And so we have spin uh, the spin on side i and spin on side j. And this notation here with the brackets simply means that we correspond we we, we only consider uh, the 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 pairs i j that are nearest neighbor. So there is near neighbors are only the interaction that we include. So we sum over all of them. This is going to give me the spin on, on uh, side J, and this is going to give me the spin on side I. So if they are both up or both down, this is going to be one. And if one is up and one is down, this is going to be minus one. So because we have a minus J in front here, when if J is a positive number, uh, if those two those two spins are aligned in the same direction, this corresponds to a negative number, so a stabilization factor. So that would be a ferromagnetic uh, ordering where we want the spin to be aligned, and this this is going to be the example I showed here on the right. So we could also do the same the same uh, thing with the anti-ferromagnetism, where J negative would mean that the spin tend to uh, be anti-parallel. Uh, that's that's another application of the method that I'm going to to mention now. So let's try to show an example now of a of a of a square. So we're going to consider four uh, sites uh, that are organized on a square. So we this is the reason why it's an interesting problem is that you can actually enumerate all the states. So all the states can be can be like this. So since we have four uh, different uh, sites, we have two possibilities for each side. So it's two times two times two times two. So two to the power four, which is 16 configurations. And we can uh, actually calculate them uh, explicitly. Uh, that's not going to be the case for larger lattice, but let's not worry about that just yet. So that's you do that and you calculate the energy. And then you find the brown state, which is this case, those two cases where they are all aligned. And we have also the larger energy when they are actually in anti-ferromagnetic uh, configuration, which maximizes the energy because each neighbor has a different, uh, has a different, as a neighbor that has, that has a spin that's opposite. And then in the middle, we have all the rest. So 12 states that are random state, if you will, and those states will have different different uh, magnetic moment, but they will all consider, they will have an energy of zero. And the energy of zero is because you have as many plus minus, uh, minus plus as you have minus minus and plus plus. So that's the idea, okay? So this example here, you have one uh, favorable interaction here, one favorable interaction here, one unfavorable one here and one unfavorable one here. So on average, the energy is zero. So why is it important to be able to, to list and to enumerate all those states is because then we can calculate the partition function. So we can calculate the partition function. Remember, it's the sum of all the Boltzmann factor. Uh, and so we have three states with the degeneracy two, 12 and two. So that's what we see here, two, 12 and two with the energy here. Turns out that this particular case case can be is analytical, and then we find that the the partition function will be 12 plus hyperbolic cosine four beta j with beta equal one over kBT. Uh, it's pretty straightforward to get the uh, uh, z for calculating the derivative of the logarithm of. Uh, if you can, it's pretty straightforward. Sorry to calculate the energy, the average energy. Uh, by calculating the derivative of the logarithm of z. And so we obtain this, this term here, which is exact for this particular case. Uh, so you can plot this, it's always useful. You plot this and you see that uh, the average energy when you have very low temperature, uh, it's going to be minus four J. So that is where the entropic term does not matter so much here, right? So you, you end up minus four J. So this is the, going to be the state you find. And as you increase the temperature, uh, you 
get closer and closer to zero on average. So in other words, zero on average means that every state is, is possible and the average energy will be, will be zero. Uh, this is where the Boltzmann factors are pretty much all the same. So you, we see that uh, we cross over from the highly ordered case to the less order, but in a very broad fashion. And in, but this, this, uh, this transition will be much sharper when you have more sites. Remember, you only have four sites. It's a very, very small lattice. One thing that, is, uh, that has to be said as well is that you have two ground states here. Uh, however, uh, imagine that the, all the four spins are aligned in the same direction. Um, let's say up. We know that it's equally likely to find the, the, the spins uh, aligned downward. Okay. However, moving from uh, all the four spin being up to all the four spin being down means we need to have fluctuations of four spin out of four. So this is very an, a very unlikely transition. So that means that everything we've said so far, where we did not worry too much about how you transition from an energy state to another one, might be a little bit different in reality. This is the reason why we added this sentence, which says that we have to be careful when we try to solve complex systems, and this system is not even really complex. Let's try to have a look at the in one dimension. This is a very useful uh, thing to look at. Uh, so again, this is the Helmholtz energy U minus T S, and you have the the ground state here where all the spins are aligned in one dimension. Now here's the thing that's interesting. If you flip completely, if you pick one point in in the in the in the in the chain and you flip completely all the states that are on your right, let's say. Uh, it turns out that doing this, this flip only costs you 2j. Indeed, you are losing one interaction here, j, and you are, so it's, it, it was minus j, let's say, and this minus j becomes plus j, so going from here to here is a, just a, a jump of 2j. However, so, so this is the, the u term. How, however, what's more interesting is the entropy. So the entropy can be calculated uh, here and it turns out that the, the change in entropy, okay, the change in entropy is related to the, the number of, the, the, the number of, of additional microstate that we can do. And of course here, the thing is, we, if we have a chain of, of n sites, I have n possibilities to find, to, to create this, this discontinuity. I can pick any places. So basically, that means that, that that increases the number of microstates by, by that factor. And we find in the entropy gain will be Kb ln n, n being the number of possibilities to cut the chain at a given place. So that's nice because now you can calculate the change in free energy, and then we find this, this, this uh, equation. So this equation is extremely important because 2j is, of course, a constant. But this term here, OK? Unless you're at t equals zero, this term is going to uh, be more and more negative as n increases. Okay. In fact, once n is large enough, the entropy will always win in in the sense that um, in the sense that delta s will be uh, dominated by the entropic term. And the reason for this is that any term, if so long as t is larger than zero, even a small value of n will actually uh, move the reaction towards a negative delta f, which is the natural direction for, for an evolution of a thermodynamic system, and it will happen no matter what. So that means that getting to the ground state here is very unlikely. It's very unlikely, and in fact, uh, that's that. That's the reason why we we do not see a phase transition. We unless it's at t, t equals zero, and then there is no long range order at uh, time t larger than zero. So in order to have a long range order, we would need to avoid all those fluctuations. However, those fluctuations, as I explained here, correspond to a decrease in entropy. I mean, an increase in, in entropy. So a decrease in the minus T S. That um, that's actually. Uh, stabilize the system and provide a thermodynamic arrow of time, if you will. Now we can move to the two-dimensional case and go back to the picture I showed you before. 
Now, the problem is this is a different case now. In two dimension, flipping one spin is not going to create uh, to create uh, the the it's not going to break the long range ordering the same way as it did in, in the one dimensional case. So, in fact, in two dimension, it is possible to have a long range order uh, and to make it stable. And in fact, we can find that there is a phase transition in the 2D icing model, as opposed to the 1D icing model, which does not have a phase transition uh, at finite temperature. So, so now, now the issue in two dimension, though, is that because each side has a, as as a as as a power of two uh, as a as a as a pro two possibilities, if we have n by n uh, grid like this n being so n square sites, the number of possibilities go as two to the power n square right two times two times two times two times two n square times that. So what we find when we do this is that even for a fairly small system like six, six times six, which is actually just oh, five by five, let's say five by five, this system here. So n squared is 25, 25 sites, but the number of configurations I can, I can do is already uh, 33 uh, million uh, configurations possible. And of course that number increases very quickly, uh, increases quadratically with the number of sites. So that means that the, what I did for the one dimensional case, uh, or actually not for the one dimensional case, for the, for the four atom cell, so that was this case with 16, 16 configuration, uh, what, I, um, what, what, I, what I found there, uh, actually, no, it was a two by two, sorry, this 16 configuration. So what, what I did there, I can't do here. And I can, so I cannot calculate the partition function exactly by enumerating all the states. That's just not possible. There's just too many states to calculate. So that's the reason why uh, we uh, use uh, computational algorithm to try to solve this problem. Uh, so instead of listing all those states, we're trying to basically mimic nature and try to find if we can reproduce result from nature. So that's, is what, that's what I'm going to explain in the next slide or two. And so the method that we use is using the uh, Monte Carlo method. So Monte Carlo method come from Monte Carlo, which is which is in Monaco. It's a place where there are uh, famous uh, uh, casinos. And uh, so the idea is that uh, uh, when people came up with the idea of doing uh, random number generation uh, to to uh, to do computational physics, so it's a, it's a great it's a field by itself. People uh, did, made the parallel with the randomness of, of gambling in the casino, so they called it the Monte Carlo method. So the advantage of this, of the Monte Carlo method, is that we try to mimic nature by saying that nature is going to fluctuate. It's going to, if we if we let a spin, if we let a, an, a, a range of spin on a square lattice uh, uh, evolve at a finite temperature, they will fluctuate. So the spin are going to fluctuate and then eventually either uh, uh, give an ordered system or disordered system, go through uh, a phase transition as you change the temperature and so on and so forth. So the idea is to do, is to do the same, is to, uh, is to fluctuate, uh, to make the system fluctuate. And with the idea, and then we are going to see this in the, in the detail of the Monte Carlo methods, which is a specific uh, implementation of it will be the uh, Metropolis algorithm. The idea there would be to fine tune the probability of, of the flip that we are going to do. So let's try to, do, see, to see how we can mimic nature. So the Metropolis algorithm works like this. We have our collection of spin and we pick one spin randomly, which is something easy to do on the computer. And then we flip its, its spin. So if it was up, we make it down. If it was down, we make him up. So we calculate the energy of the system, and if the energy goes down, we accept the move. We just say that the move is accepted. Now, if the energy goes up, we are only going to accept the we are going to accept the flip only with the probability using the Boltzmann factor. So, for example, uh, when we see the probability will be e to the power minus beta delta e. 
uh, that means that if delta E is very, very much positive, it's a very large number, so we have lower probability of accepting it. That's the idea. And of course, we reject it otherwise. And then after that, we repeat that cycle. We pick another rand uh, spin randomly, and then we flip it. And when do we stop? Well, we stop when equilibrium is reached. And we know equilibrium thermodynamically what it means. It means that if we take a thermodynamic variable, like, for example, the heat capacity or the magnetic moment, um, even though things keep moving dynamically, the average value of those quantities um, remains uh, constant. So, so why does it work? Well, it's actually pretty easy to see. Uh, at least he has something useful. It's that, uh, it's, it's that uh, at temperature t equals zero, uh, we will see that we only flip a spin if it lowers the, energy, the system's energy, otherwise the acceptance rate is, is zero, okay? At high temperature, the acceptance rate is almost equal to one, right? Beta is one over kBT, so if t goes to infinity, we basically have e to the power zero. So the acceptance rate is, is almost uh, equal to the identity and the spin is usually flipped. So we, we follow, it follows that uh, th this is an algorithm that, that works very well at low temperature and works pretty well at high temperature as well. And so that allows us to, to get the right probability of, of picking a state uh, according to the uh, Boltzmann distribution as well. So this is, this is what works very well. So let's see, have, let's have a look at this. And by the way, this is pretty easy to implement on the computer. So uh, just a little bit of math here, just to tell you that we get, can get a lot of information from a metropolis, a metropolis uh, algorithm run. For example, the, the energy, so the, the expectation value of the energy can be calculated uh, this way if we know, if we knew the, the partition function, of course, this is the usual description for the, for the internal energy as a function of minus the derivative of L and Z. We can also calculate the expectation value of the square of the energy. This is just starting from here again, uh, from uh, on the partition function as well with a second derivative. And so, if you remember that the heat capacity is the derivative of E with respect to temperature, you can find after some simple algebra that the heat capacity in this case uh, can be calculated simply this way, uh, by, by subtracting this value and the square of this value. Good. Now suppose that the energy for some reason depends uh, linearly on some variable X with, with a B here. Well, it could be, for example, the magnetic moment or the magnetic field. The minus comes from the fact that you that it's, it stabilizes the system for the variable described by x and by b to be aligned. Right? Think about magnetic moment and an external magnetic field, for instance. So when we have that, we can calculate the expectation value of x, which one more time can be obtained by uh, including these terms here. Right? This is a correction on the energy. So we have the energy we had before corrected by bx. And one more time, we can use uh, the formulation that we have from the partition function. And we see that this particular term is equal to the derivative of the Helmholtz uh, free energy that we have calculated before. And same thing for the magnetic susceptibility can be obtained in a, a manner similar than we calculated the heat capacity. This is nothing really new. We've seen this before. The point is that we can calculate this. Now we can calculate those fluctuations in, during the, the computational run and actually understand things a bit better. And in fact, this is what we show here on this on this uh, slide, where we have, uh, we actually perform a metropolis algorithm for different temperatures. So for each temperature, we stay there, and then we do the run that I, that I explained to you in the metropolis loop. So we did loops, 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 until this is not changing anymore, and then we move the temperature and we keep going. So what we find in this two-dimensional solution is that we do have a phase transition between a high magnetic uh, uh, configuration to a low magnetic configuration. So there is a, there is a net magne uh, magnetization here, and there is no more magnetization at high temperature. So we are going to see in, a pre in the next slide that what we have actually here is an ordering, spin ordering, and here spin disordering. And then we can, we, we see here again that, the, of course, the heat capacity is uh, related to the derivative of the, of the magnetization, uh, just the same way as what, what we've done before 
in 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 the beginning of this of the lecture 28 and so of course it's since the derivative the derivative of this discontinuous function is going to give me a spike like a, a, a Dirac delta type of distribution so we find that the energy goes from minus 4j which is basically uh, each atom interacting uh, attractively with the four neighbors in the lattice so that's five, minus 4j until it reaches a certain energy and then actually if you keep going a higher and higher temperature it's going to be on average the energy is going to be zero so what's interesting is that if i zoom on the heat capacity and uh, i see that uh, the the in fact that's one thing i should have said a minute ago uh, this particular problem has been solved uh, analytically by uh, onsacker uh, and it's in in the 20th century century and that this is the the this, uh, these lines here that's, that shows in, in full line. The result of the algorithm, the metropol metropolis algorithm are given by dots. So what happens is that when you zoom like here, you see that, uh, yes, you can say that the agreement between the metropolis algorithm and the analytical solution is excellent, but there, the, most of the fluctuations and the issues are around the transition. And so we can, we can understand that by looking at the evolution of the map of spin as we increase the temperature. So at low temperature, we see this is totally black. It could have been totally white. You know, that it's a it's a degenerate state. So it can be all the spin up, it's completely black, or all the spin down, we would have been completely white. The two the two configurations are are degenerate, but the system picked this one randomly. And as you increase the temperature, you start to see fluctuations. Uh, a few a few white blobs start to appear and this fluctuation uh, 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 take place and you start to actually change slightly the, the magnetization. Now when you get very close to before uh, very close to the to the transition to the, the phase transition uh, temperature, you start to see more and more blobs here and actually those fluctuations are actually pretty slow. Uh, and the reason why they are slow is because you have those large domains and this is very difficult to flip complete domains that we have here. So, uh, but you start to create those domains that are growing larger and larger. And then at some point, uh, when you're way beyond uh, the, 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 the transition temperature, the phase transition temperature, you see that the correlation length uh, between uh, spins is essentially gone. So. At this very, very high temperature, you see that the internal energy part of the problem does not play a role anymore. Instead, the system is trying to optimize, to maximize its entropy. So it's completely entropy driven. And this is the reason why you have essentially no uh, even sh short order uh, ordering in, in this, thing, uh, this thing. And this, is, this can all be captured by the Metropolis uh, algorithm. So I think the Metropolis algorithm is a very powerful tool. I just like all the Monte Carlo methods are, are very powerful tools to do computational uh, physics. And in particular for those problems with statistical mechanics, uh, they can be used directly. And in fact, I would say, uh, I would go as far as saying that you cannot truly understand the use of Monte Carlo methods uh, computationally if you do not understand uh, thermodynamics and statistical mechanics in particular, since at the end of the day, it's all a matter of sampling uh, the problems, sampling the, the, the configuration space, and trying to find a good representation of the partition function. So there are different, a number of different algorithms. Uh, Metropolis is one of the, of the historically most uh, popular one. Uh, there are other algorithms that try to sample uh, the states like this as well. But this is not going to be the topic of this course. Um, instead, um, I think that uh, we can uh, can move on from here, and then we, we are going to start to look into uh, other specific special topics uh, as we move along uh, in this course. Thank you very much for your attention.